and welcome. I'm Peter Suderman, filling in for Matt Welch, who is, we hope, reconsidering his love for the French healthcare system. And this is The Reason Roundtable, the only political podcast that celebrates your independence every day. Today, I am joined by my regular co-panelists, Nick Gillespie and Catherine Mangu ward as well as special guest, Elizabeth Nolan-Brown. Everyone say hello. Howdy. Hi, Hi. Uh, Peter. Happy Monday and happy belated birthday to America. Yes, you're getting on in years, but you're looking pretty good for such an advanced age. America's current president, on the other hand, not so much. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But first, a word from our sponsor. The most important ideas are those debated on college campuses. Think about how many different fringe concepts initially spawned in the academy that are now prevalent across society. F.A. Hayek noticed this phenomenon. The ideas developed in academia soon spread to the rest of society. That's why Students for Liberty supports students like me in spreading the ideas of liberty on campuses. As a coordinator with SFL, I've hosted high-profile speakers to discuss the pressing issues of the day, published magazines and articles to spread pro-liberty ideas, and helped organize and attend conferences on campuses around the world. SFL connected me with partner organizations, and thanks to SFL, I've been accepted to internships at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, National Review, the Cato Institute, and will start as an assistant editor at Reason Magazine this summer. My name is Jack McCastro, and I'm one of the thousands of volunteers from the SFL network building a freer future for people across the globe. Visit SpreadLiberty.org to discover how you can contribute to building a freer future at school and beyond. On Friday, President Joe Biden sat for a brief interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Biden defended his competence and his ability to beat Donald Trump in the election this year after a disastrous debate performance the prior week. But he seemed halting at times, and he refused to take a cognitive test. The consensus was that Biden performed better than at the debate, but it wasn't enough. And so over the weekend, Biden was greeted with headlines like major Democratic donors are devising plans to pressure Biden to step aside. That was in The New York Times. These voters supported President Biden in 2020, and now they want a plan B. Also, The New York Times. Unbendable Biden versus breaking point Dems. That's an Axios. And more Democrats call on Biden to step aside as he campaigns in Pennsylvania. That's in the Washington Post. Similarly, Politico ran a story about how during a private call with party leadership, multiple senior House Democrats called on Biden to pull out of the race. Presumably, you need all of these stories because every time Biden reads one, he just forgets it 10 minutes later. But the point is, The Biden age story is everywhere in the press. It wasn't always that way, however. In a spicy feature titled The Conspiracy of Silence to Protect Joe Biden, New York Magazine's Olivia Nuzzi wrote about the media's unwillingness to confront Biden's obvious frailty and decline. Nuzzi's story described episodes in which Biden didn't remember the names of longtime friends. She wrote that his decline had been treated like a dark family secret for many elite supporters. The story was devastating, both for Biden and the national political media. Now, to be fair, it wasn't true that no major outlet raised concerns about Biden's age at all. The Wall Street Journal published a deeply reported piece about Biden's infirmity. Ezra Klein of the New York Times argued earlier this year that Biden should consider dropping out of the race. Alex Thompson of Axios wrote about Biden's age-related issues. We, of course, have discussed them on the Reason Roundtable. But far too much of the press corps was obsequious and pathetically deferential to the out-of-touch Methuselah in the White House. And that failure to confront reality, a reality that was glaringly obvious to anyone, anyone who, with eyes, with ears, who was paying any attention at all, that failure has clearly put the country in a perilous state. So we're going to start this week with a segment I feel compelled to call Age Gap Discourse. Oh. Nick, to me, coverage of yeah. Biden's decline raises all sorts of issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to you first, Nick. Um, right. Th- so okay. this raises all sorts of issues about media bias and complicity here. But at heart, I think it's really about trust. This is why Americans don't trust the media. This is why Americans don't trust politicians. You have written extensively about the problems with low trust societies, the way that lack of social trust is co- corrosive. Uh, how does that play into the decline? How does this play into the decline of trust in America, in society? And how do we rebuild that trust? Is that even possible right now? Well, uh, two distinct questions. And, you know, to the first one, this furthers it along. And, it you know, it's it's already kind of 
riding on a, uh, you know, it's like a log flume. It's not coming back to the uh, station and it's picking up steam. And it, uh, the, you know, you don't know where the bottom is going to be, but this helps. Wait, do Only log a month flumes ago, have steam? <laughs> Or stations. The log flumes have log flumes have uh, they have stations uh, where you go and uh, get in the fake canoe or you know the dugout uh, timber. Uh, I think I will uh, go to the mat that I've been on more log flumes than all of you combined. But uh, you <laughs> that's know, just because of your age. I've, I've ridden a lot of log flumes. Let, it is. I believe me. If I don't remember them in reality, I'm just making it up. So you know, in this case, uh, it's very apropos for this section. I was just going to say a month ago in the New York Times, uh, in an article, uh, there was a head a headline saying Stephen Colbert finds the focus on Biden's age to be old news, and then it lists a bunch of late night comedians making fun of the fixation on Donald Trump, uh, on Joe Biden being ancient and old and things like that. Um, so all of this is of a piece. I think what is most interesting to me is not that the press is in the tank for Joe Biden and has been, and now they're going to start going overboard and saying, you know, we caused all of this, uh, you know, we're the problem, we're the center. I mean, the, the the media has main character syndrome more than, you know, Elon Musk or Donald Trump does. Um, it's been over a year where uh, Donald Trump has been leading Joe Biden in the polls, according to Real Clear Politics. So it's the media finally catching up with the fact that Joe Biden is an unpopular president. Now they want to talk about why and they want to talk about their starring role in why he is a terrible candidate who is going to lose and they want him to win. So that, you know, that kind of gets to your first question, Peter. The second one is how do you rebuild it? It's by actually it's by doing two things. It's by acknowledging the mistakes that you've made and why you've made them. And then it is actually doing things differently. And there is no reason to believe that. I mean, I, you know, I know uh, Olivia Nuzzi of New York Magazine. She's, you know, an excellent reporter and all of that. But like when I read a, uh, you know, when I read a reporter who follows Biden around all the time and starts to say, oh, yeah, you know what? I was covering up, but, you know, I'm telling the truth now that doesn't, you know, that doesn't give me anything to work with. Uh, you know, they need to start actually doing stuff differently. And I don't think the age thing is the biggest issue in this race. I think it's just becoming the whipping post for the press to explain why Biden is going to lose. And he was going to lose, according to the polls before the debate. Catherine, Donald Trump was president for four years. During that time, we heard endless, endless complaints about norm violations, about how what Donald Trump was doing was just totally out of bounds. It sure seems like what Biden is now doing, which is taking counsel from his crack addict grifter son, Hunter, uh, uh, insisting on his fitness and capacity, despite obvious evidence to the contrary, is kind of a norm violation. So I, I guess my question here is just, uh, but my norms with a yeah, question mark at the end? The way in which uh, some of the high ground that Biden has is eroding in the face of this kind of old age scandal, I guess, is pretty notable. Um, I think the uniting factor here is hubris. Both of these candidates are out here pretending like I think not even pretending, genuinely believing. I don't I don't think it's I think it's sincere that they are the best or maybe even the only people who can do this job. And that's just obviously untrue in a way that if they had advisors who were not related to them, if they had advisors who were kind of outside of this these tiny inner circles of trust that they've both created, um, someone might have said that to them and uh, they might have been able to hear it. And Unfortunately, I think the thing that that Biden and Trump both have in common is this unfounded belief that they're the only ones. I mean, I think both parties are having the same thought right now, which is, oh, my God, we would be winning this election by a landslide if we had just run a normal governor, just like your Doug Burgums, a J.B. Pritzker. If I'm being very, very greedy, like a Jared Polis, just like somebody who is boring 
and who puts the sentences together and who is the right age and has the right resume would be crushing either of these candidates. And that's not the path they chose because they chose to kind of go along with the delusion and hubris of these two kind of elderly kings of the parties. Magazine editor wants candidate who can put sentences together. Every news, day. Sir. That's all news I News at 11. We've, we've really only yeah. had one out of the past four presidents who can do that. Well, and, and that worked out pretty great for us. Uh, Obama was yeah. Reason Magazine's favorite president for sure, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, now so, it's like, I like the broken English. Let's you know, it's, bring- it's better uh, than the alternative. Let's bring uh, Liz into this. Uh, the media has run with this story uh, about Biden's decline over the past week or so. It is at the top of every major news website. Every major broadcast is leading with this. ABC did a whole special interview. They are not ignoring the story now, but many did for a long time. And my question to you, Liz, because I know you are a student of the media and you kind of understand how some of this works behind the scenes. Why did it take so long? Yeah, um, I. It, it's interesting that there's just been such a taboo about about talking about it. I mean, I think you know partly because voters in general are are older, and also you know the country runs on on boomer power still. And I think that there's been you know th in general that's there's like a taboo. desert power, but for old people. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so I think, you know, unfortunately, it, it, we general... don't have the batteries to store it. So <laughs> it just... I think Elon Musk is working on that. Yeah, it'll be too late. I just think that there's been, you know, this this fear of, of alienating um, voters, older voters uh, who, who, you know, are, are the core of the voting electorate for if they talk too much about people being old. Um, I think that's part of it, at least, you know, like a little bit of just like worrying that, you know, you're going to be accused of ageism or that people are going to be like, well, wait, I'm that age. Are you saying I'm like that? So I think that there's some of that. And also just, but as you know, as Catherine said, the parties have just committed to these two people and especially the Democrats have committed to Biden and going along with his delusions. And, and also, you know, they've, they've backed themselves into this corner where they don't want to run, you know, Harris either. So on some level, unless Biden is just like out there being completely, you know, decrepit and incompetent, he seemed like their best bet. And so there's just been this, this general feeling that, you know, we, we can't talk about this because a lot of the media doesn't want to give the election to Trump again. They already feel like bad, like they gave the election to Trump back in 2016. I think there's still a lot of mainstream media who thinks their their job is to, you know, um, determine which way the election goes a little bit. And so, uh, you know, I've, I know I've been sort of all over the place with my answer here, but I just think you've the, got it, this... It's multi-causal, right? There's, yeah. there's not one reason here. I mean, I, I think the incentives but, were really aligned in a bunch of ways for journalists, for uh, powerful White House press corps journalists in particular, or influential, right? Folks who are there close to the president, they want to preserve that access. And the Biden administration has been quite stingy with access generally, and they've been especially willing to be retributive, uh, uh, retributive, what's the word? To, to like exact revenge against yeah. the reporters revenge. who... Who, right. Yeah, they've been revenge seeking against the reporters who have reported on Biden's age. And so those and the folks who have been willing to come out and say, look, he's old, he's frail, he's in decline. They have lost access opportunities that they might otherwise have had. And, well, and that so has other created reporters. Yeah. Other reporters have been yes. really like, you know, have been really angry at people who do point this out, too. So I think that there's this, you know, sense of people feeling worried about being being shamed by other pe members of the media and, you know, being told that they're the reason that Donald Trump's going to get elected because they're over focusing on these right wing talking points about Biden's age and things like that. So, yeah, it's just been, you know, the media being too afraid to. If to I may, part that. part of the part of the puzzle here, though, is the voters themselves. And right after the debate, or, or starting the day after and for a few days after, the New York Times and Siena College or Siena University ran a poll, and they asked Democrats, pre-debate, do you want Biden to be the candidate? Should he remain the nominee? And the answer was 52% wanted him to remain the, uh, the, the um, nominee. After the debate, it went down to 48%. Um, but uh, you know, so it's not like a huge swing. Independence had something similar before the debate. 21% wanted a different candidate after the debate, 22%. Uh, Republicans were asked about Trump 
80% wanted him before, 83% after the debate. So we're not necessarily like the voters. I, you know, I don't think this, I think this is fundamentally a media story. And it's like, you know, it's that the people who cover Joe Biden want Joe Biden to win. Uh, there were reasons for that. Uh, they did not particularly, they were not interested in, uh, you know, a more progressive candidate. Uh, people in the Democratic Party wanted to go with Joe Biden because he had beaten Trump handily, uh, at least in the popular vote the last time. And there didn't seem reason to change who would have been better and things like that. And I think now what we're seeing and what bothers me more is the massive cover your ass type stuff that the media is going to do. And somehow it's going to end up that uh, people like us who are political independents or people who have always been critical, not just of Biden's age, but of his actual policies, somehow were the problem or the press is pretending that they determine who becomes president and who doesn't, period. Um, you know, and it's just to me, this is it. We're in a moral panic. We're in a media moral panic about their role in, in their own you know, blindness. Just my, my sample size of two of like, you know, Midwestern swing voters, though, my, my parents who are like the quintessential swing voters voted for Republicans, independents, Democrats, no clear pattern whatsoever. Um, they did come away from watching the, the debates the other night and both said to me independently. Um, so who's the libertarian candidate this year? Like they, they really <laughs> actually were kind of maybe going to be Biden voters because they were just so put off by Donald Trump, but now are so put off by Biden, too, that they're both, you know, considering voting for Chase Oliver. So. And if they do, that will not be because third parties are spoilers. It will be because the major parties absolutely yeah. suck. And yeah. that thing that like will ne that message never makes it through in the end. OK, Catherine, since you bring up both major party sucking, I want to run something by you. It seems to me that there are a lot of parallels between what's happening with Biden now and what happened with Donald Trump in 2016. So both men are old and arguably unfit for office. Both are stubborn and have inflated views of their own historical role and purpose. Party elites and friendly uh, columnists opposed both and called for them to step down and be ousted by some process or uh, cabal of leadership. Uh, defenders of both, meanwhile, have said, OK, sure, there are problems, but the process will work. The staff will cover for weaknesses. And boy, boy, the other guy is worse. And in so many ways, they just seem like mirror images of each other. So, Catherine, are both of these tired old men really just the same? Let me let me invite you to rant. <sighs> They are not really just the same. And I, I regret to have to say that because it, I, my heart in my heart is with these guys are both the same. They are both uh, nightmare candidates who will do bad policies and also potentially are uh, bad people. Um, Sounds pretty much the same to me. I So as my baseline, I want to say that they're bad in different ways. And I think that that's what people really mean when they say the other guy is so bad. They mean the other guy is so bad in a specific way that I consider worse. And I think, you know, it goes without saying, it doesn't go without saying, we're going to say it, we have to say it over and over. Uh, the way that January 6th went down, I think was a notable outlier. And Trump's role in that was very, very clear to me as, uh, you know, my, my norms felt violated. Uh, it takes a lot for me to worry about my norms, but that one violated my norms. And, um, you know, Biden is bad in a different way. Uh, he is, he is bad in the way that um, many kind of mainstream Democratic politicians are bad, but with the added bonus that he is increasingly converging on some of the ways that Trump is bad, like an over-reliance on an inner circle of his family. The thing that I find parallel, uh, the parallel that you set up with 2016 is this desperate sense of themselves as outsiders. Uh, Biden was on Morning Joe this morning saying that he was so frustrated with the elites for treating him this way. My man, my brother in Christ, you are the literal president of the United States. There is no elite more elite than you. Uh, and Trump acted this way, too. He was always like, oh, God, the elites are so cruel to me when he was, again, the literal president of the United States. You cannot be an outsider and also be the president of the United States. And I think that is just one of the many, many delusions that they are both laboring under. We're just coming to terms with some of the other ones that Biden is is um kind of existing within right now, including the my polls say I'm ahead, including the, um, 
you know, now eerily parallel. My doctors say I'm fine. My doctors say I'm the finest. My doctors say I'm the healthiest person who's ever even considered running for president. Um, to me, this is, uh, you know, these are all just signs of a sort of gradual detachment from reality that both of the candidates suffer from. The consequences have been different. The consequences are different. They are both bad. They are different bad. All right, let's take a look at actual reality. In the ABC uh -huh. interview, Biden said he just had a bad night during the debate. He said he was exhausted, apparently from a trip he took 12 days beforehand on Air Force One. I don't know, sounds sounds very rough. Uh, he also said he won't drop out with us without a sign from the almighty. So I want to play everyone a clip from that interview and then have you all respond. Would you be willing to undergo an independent medical evaluation that included neurological and cognitive, cognitive tests and release the results to the American people? Look, I have a cognitive test every single day. Every day I have that test. Everything I do. You know, not only am I campaigning, but I'm running the world. Not, and that's not how it sounds like hyperbole. But we are the central nation in the world. I don't know if that was right. And every single day, for example, today, before I come out here, I'm on the phone with the, with the Prime Minister of, well, anyway, I shouldn't get into detail, but with Netanyahu. I'm on the phone with the new Prime Minister of England. I'm working on what we're doing with regard to, in Europe, with regard to expansion of NATO and whether it's going to stick. I'm taking on Putin. I mean, every day, there's no day I go through, they're not those decisions I have to make every single day. Nick. Biden says he takes a cognitive test every single day. Did that make you confident in Biden's fitness? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, uh, unfortunately, he didn't say whether or not he passes it every day. Um, so, you know, he's kind of leaving himself a big out. Do, you know, that this question that it has come to this means that he is in deep shit. Um, and, you know, that you, you just can't walk away from that. And um, having said that, I think ultimately, um, for me, the question is less about Biden's mental acuity right now. And it's more about figuring out why did he start losing to Trump over a year ago in the polls? Um, and to me, that's, you know, where I want to turn this around from instead of talking about old people, including one who's too old to be a a boomer even but part of this is all part and parcel of the shift out of the boomer power mode that uh, liz kind of invoked at the beginning and and it started you know power is going to be shifting uh to millennials and to gen z i think gen x sorry is going to get screwed over and things like that but that question is why did why did people start turning against biden uh, why did Americans, you know, en masse? And I think it's because of his policies. And that, that's uh, the if there is a ray of hope in all of this is that people understood um, that four years of uh, four more years of Biden would not be a good idea. Um, Biden got to do basically everything he wanted to do. So his, you know, mental health tests aside, he's been in a long slide for a long time with the voters and for good reasons. Liz, you watched that interview, you watched that clip, but you've also been writing about Joe Biden's vice president, Kamala Harris, for years. You wrote a cover feature for us with the ripped from Twitter headline, Kamala Harris is a cop, and then a follow up with the title Kamala Harris is a flop. So my question after watching the ABC interview in which Biden makes the case for his fitness, is Biden better or worse than Kamala Harris? I don't I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, the the thing that was striking to me about that interview was how defensive and and sort of angry Biden was the whole time. I mean, you think, you know, he's this is an understandable question and even if even if it wasn't true at all, right? You know, you would you would want him to understand why people would be asking it. You think that you know he could sort of d display that and the fact that he sort of immediately was on the defensive and and downright angry about it. I don't I don't think is a good sign or or a good look whatsoever. 
Um, and, and honestly, like sort of it reminded me a little bit of Harris because I feel like she is, you know, um, she's great as long as everything is going her way. And as soon as people sort of press her on things, she has that sort of um, a real defensiveness about her that that just doesn't come across well. And I think makes people, you know, um, wary of her. Uh, you know, I think she policy wise, I think she would be basically about the same as Biden at this point. But again, it's hard to know because like, Harris has no political core. So what what sort of Harris we would be getting if she was the candidate and if that if she, you know, was the president? It's just it's it's anybody's guess, you know? Like we could have sort of, you know, the one that's like I'm going to be tough on crime and everything or we could have someone who's going to be like no, I'm going to, you know, pander to the most left-wing parts of the party. Um I think it affects she would be just a lot like Biden and end up being a pretty pretty boring centrist and bad in all the ways that, you know, Biden is bad but not anything extreme. But like, who knows actually with Harris? Catherine, uh, it, in that clip that we watched, Biden talked about how he runs the world, which I'm sure just made you like it, it made your heart feel so good, right? That was, that was a warm and friendly moment for you. Uh, but that does get to something that Liz talked about here that does get to something that we all care about, which is that if Biden were no longer on the ticket, that would mean a shift in the agenda, even if it's a, a small one for the Democratic Party. So talk us through what you think the policy stakes are here for Biden dropping out if he were to do so. So I think, you know, in that interview, which, by the way, I uh, was in New York last week, so I watched it with Matt Welsh. So even though he is not on this podcast, I can channel his reaction, which was just just open mouthed horror like both of Did us he look like biden joe biden mouth. at horror. the debate it's like yeah. joe biden at the debate we're like just jaws swinging in the wind it was really very <laughs> um luckily we were also like we were having tacos which like eased some of the sadness but um we can't be eating also, tacos it, for the next four great. years if your if your mouth is agape, right, you could just put the taco, put taco right in. in. That's what it's... we did, but we can't. That's not a sustainable strategy, Peter. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I think that both Biden and Harris have this word salad trait in common, and in that way, there would be continuity. The one achievement that Biden tried to highlight in that interview, although he did it really quite ineptly, was he kept talking about NATO, putting NATO together, keeping NATO together, something, something NATO. Um, if you didn't already have some idea of what he was talking about, you would not have no idea what he was talking about. And uh, I think that that is, you know, when, he, when, we're, when we're saying he runs the world, he's in charge of the world, he rules the world, I, I think that's, that's how he conceives of it in this kind of role, this you know, late 20th century, early 21st century U.S. as the world's policeman and diplomat and uniter and, you know, moderator. Um, I, I mean, certainly he says, in addition, he, he calls the United States the essential nation. And look, I'm I'm a patriot and I think America is a great country. But his view of its essentialness is that it should have its influence, that it should have its fingers in absolutely everything at all times, and that the president is at the center of that, which is remarkable, given that he doesn't seem to be able to operate after 8 p.m. Like the world goes on after 8 p.m. There are other time zones, my man. Well, he could if he can kind of time the time zone overlaps, maybe it'll be it'll be fine. Uh, but as I say, this is actually a place that I, I see him diverging most from Harris, because I you don't really hear that message from her. And I do think it's generational. You know, he sounds like an old cold warrior. He sounds like he sounds like somebody talking about an America that really doesn't exist anymore. All right. So Biden was not the only presidential hopeful being judged last week. We're going to switch topics here. The Supreme Court delivered a major ruling on former President Trump's claims of legal immunity, saying basically that yeah, the president is immune <laughs> from uh, prosecution for official acts, even though it did not accept Trump's much, much more expansive claims of, uh, of immunity from prosecution. So what are official acts? Well, the Supreme Court's answer to that question was, eh, we'll just have to figure it out later. So for this segment, we are going to channel Dostoevsky and call it crime and lack of punishment. Nick, on this podcast, you have repeatedly claim, uh, complained about lawfare. You've called for de-escalation of legal attacks to resolve political disputes. This ruling seems to take a lot of presidential action off the table in terms of making it a crime. Was this a good decision? I, I want to point out first, though, that I have a longer history of being against segment titles, and that I am doubling <laughs> down on. 
Um, I uh, segment I'm titles okay are with, not a crime. Yeah, they are in my uh, <laughs> it, when I become president. When I become eighty years old and think that I'm president. Well, good um, thing none of us I, uh, are voting for I, you. I, yeah, I wouldn't vote for myself either. So. Um, I, um, I go along with Jacob Sullivan on this, um, you know, I think it's important that the president or, you know, other government agents on, you know, on a certain level have a room, a scope for, you know, free action where they don't have to worry about being put in jail for everything that they do all of the time. I think this is probably a little overly broad or a little overly forgiving, uh, to the president, but it kind of gets it right. So, um, you know, in and then in the long run, it is like all of this stuff, you know, the, the Supreme Court reads the newspapers um, and, um, you know, like we we will find out when we find out when the president has gone too far. Um, so I think it's a it's a good rebuke to uh, Trump's expansionist view, but it's not as big a deal as people are thinking. We'll find out when we find out the president has gone too far is actually it's the same with segment titles. Uh, Catherine, I, I want to ask you about the the pushback to this ruling in a dissent. Justice Sotomayor warned that the court's decision could make a president immune from things like actual political assassination. Here's the relevant quote. Um, when he uses his powers in any way under the majority's reasoning, he will now be insulated from criminal po- prosecution order the Navy's SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival, immune. Organize a military coup to hold on to power, immune. Takes a bribe in exchange for a pardon, immune. Immune, immune, immune. Uh, Our own Jacob Solom, Nick already brought up, uh, seems to agree, writing that the decision could shield outrageous abuses of power. So I think my first question, thought here is, shouldn't Biden just take this ruling and order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate Donald Trump right now and just get all of this over with? Right. This, he's immune, according to a to to the to a democratically appointed justice. Right. To our FBI listeners, we are neither <laughs> advocating nor, uh, you know, inciting anyone to assassinate anyone. It's a thought experiment, uh, a thought experiment. A thought experiment. Uh, so too at the Supreme Court, Sotomayor is doing thought experiments. And, you know, I think um, all this does, right, is uh, as with so many um, Supreme Court rulings, it just ends up asking all the parties to um, redefine a bunch of terms. And um, that's not something that you can do unilaterally. So I don't, I do not, in fact, think it is true that in the event that a president assassinated his political rival, that the uh, relevant players would say like, well, we had that we had that one Supreme Court decision, uh, which says as long as he's doing it in official capacity, it's fine. So we're fine here. Um, this will simply require us to go back and look again at what exactly official acts are. And uh, and I think the decision leaves leaves open space for that. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, in some ways, what's more important about this decision is the timing, right? We are now out of time to go back and work our way through the process of determining which of Trump's acts um, qualify in which ways, what applies here. Um, we simply don't have enough time between now and the election. Um, and so this has fundamentally postponed postponed any reckoning uh, of uh, of Trump's acts until post-election, which matters a lot. Um, it's, it's hugely important in a kind of um, historical, factual way. Um, I, you know, I think I think it is right that I, I would like to see presidents held more personally accountable for their actions as a general matter. I think that is often the role of the electorate, not of Congress or the courts. Um, but um, but yeah, this is this is this is mostly to me interesting and important because of timing, not because of the fact that I think in the end presidents will just start assassinating people willy nilly. Liz, after January sixth. Uh- Mitch McConnell explained the GOP's reluctance to punish Trump in the moment, in part by saying, well, Trump could always be held accountable in court later. But now it seems like maybe he can't, at least in some circumstances, at least if he becomes president again. So how are we supposed to get the reckoning that Catherine desires? How are we supposed to hold presidents accountable? I mean, I think there's probably, you know, a big difference between presidents assassinating their their rivals and and what Trump did. And, you know, uh, as, as we've all, I think, commented and written at Reason, like, 
it's a it's a pretty gray area what Trump did in a lot of the things, you know, especially a lot of the charges which relate to him, you know, um, his speech, essentially. So I think, you know, the fact that we might not get a reckoning for that is is OK in a way that, you know, us not getting a reckoning for for the political assassinations would not be OK. Um, and, you know, that we we have to be able to be OK with the fact that that, that there might not be this this big reckoning there for for the january 6th stuff all right let's honestly reckon. i wish we would stop talking about it but i mean that's just <laughs> sort of it's we're it's never past. going to stop let it go guys let it. that shit go <laughs> yeah, not gonna the be past is, go. <laughs> this is the problem though the past is all we have and we're gonna have to reckon with it but first we're gonna reckon with our mid-show ad before we continue with the reason roundtable i want to tell you about today's sponsor lumen the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. Then on the Lumen app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried it, and I've got to tell you, Lumen is a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy, and it's fun to use, seriously. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health. And get this, it can also track your cycle as well as the onset of menopause. Women, and adjust your recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts so you can keep up your energy and stave off cravings. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me and use Roundtable to get $100 off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N D-O-T dot M-E and use Roundtable at checkout for $100 off. Thanks, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. And now back to The Reason Roundtable. So for our reader question, we have a holiday themed segment called May the Fourth Be With You. It's a musical thought experiment of sorts, mm. um, and it's about Bruce Springsteen. Uh, ben writes, happy fourth, y'all, is born in the USA, which turns 40 this year, a patriotic song. Ben, I just want to thank you for a short, pithy question that is about something cultural. Uh, Catherine, you love Bruce, Bruce Springsteen and old man music. Let's go to you first. I'm so glad you came to me for my expertise on Bruce Springsteen. Thank you, Peter. Um, I did some research for this question, and I discovered the origins of why people think this song is patriotic. And I regret to inform you that it's George Will's fault. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. In 1984, George Will, um, who was then the same age that I am now, upsettingly, um, <laughs> went to a Bruce Springsteen concert. Uh, and he... Uh, said, among other things, I may be the only 43-year-old American so out of the swim that I do not even know what marijuana smoke smells like. Perhaps at the concert, I was surrounded by controlled substances. Uh, that's just a, one sample of a many, many glorious lines in this column. In the column, however, George Will misunderstands what is going on uh, in this song and in this album. He sees a bunch of people with flags. He interviews one dude uh, who says that uh, he thinks that uh, the thing he likes about Bruce Springsteen is faith and traditional values. Um, the one dude's uh, lady friend says, uh, and cars and girls. And I think she was more <laughs> um, he, uh, he wrote this column where he was like, hey, uh, I like that this man is wearing man clothes and there are flags at his concerts. And that's all he had. <laughs> very, very clearly in the column that he basically had no idea what was going on and was an idiot. This was not uh, taken with enough um, seriousness by Ronald Reagan, uh, who seems to have borrowed this insight uh, and the affection for the song's underlying patriotism uh, comes from there. Um, 
nothing nothing bad should be George Will's fault. I love me some George Will, but it does seem that maybe, maybe 43-year-old George Will got a little outside of his lane, and now we have to listen to this song at political rallies forever, unfortunately. It's not a patriotic song. It's not supposed to be a patriotic song. I object. May I, may I object? <laughs> Uh, Let, let's let's reading. go to, since both of you object. Let's go to Liz Nolan okay. Brown first. Liz is a, a a a you live in blue collar America. You are a resident of the great state of Ohio. Nick is only a former resident, so I want to hear from a real middle <laughs> American whether or not Bruce Springsteen's "Born in the USA" is a patriotic song. First, I was going to say I bet Nick and I have the same objection, but like actually, Nick's a wild card, so who knows? But um, <laughs> I think you know it, it. It it's not a patriotic song in the way people think it's a patriotic song, but the idea of using music to protest uh, the government and protest injustices and protest war is a patriotic American value. So on some level, it is actually a patriotic song. That's not what George Will thought was happening. <laughs> I uh, will uh, point out not only did I live in Ohio, but I grew up uh, adjacent to Bruce Springsteen's hometown and we're from the same county. And I went to the Stone Pony, the place that gave him his start in Asbury Park many, many times. I think this is a patriotic song, not because Bruce Str Springsteen wants it to be a patriotic song. He obviously wants it to be a searing commentary on a fallen America that doesn't take care of the people who actually do the work and, uh, you know, take the bullets uh, needed to keep America free and all of that. But the people who listen to it and the people who chant along, and they were doing this in 1984 when Born in the USA uh, came out, take it as a very positive uh, patriotic song. It's a celebration of America being great and wonderful. And that whole album, which like all of Springsteen stuff, is really about how awful everything is. And you, if you're lucky, you get a short moment of sexual or, uh, or automotive release on Route 9, uh, in, you know, in, in Freehold or on the Jersey Shore. He's he he might want it to mean certain things, but people take his work completely differently, particularly on mass born in the USA, not produced as patriotic, but it is absolutely patriotic. So this is a very new critic, death of the author, like the artist has no control over meaning answer from you, which I really appreciate. I mean, yeah, Born in the USA is patriotic in the way that Gordon Gecko is awesome. Gordon Gecko was not supposed to be the hero of Wall Street, and yet he inspired so many people to go and try to become Gordon Gecko, even though Oliver Stone wrote him and directed him and created him as the villain, as the person you should not aspire to be. And yet he was... he. he there was something magnetic about him. There was something that people found uh, kind of Nobody kind of compelling. remembers and, a single line yeah. that Charlie Sheen uttered in Wall Street. But it's something you know, about the blue, hero. blue bird is ripe. Or no, yeah. what's the code phrase? I forget. It's uh, yeah. but yeah, yeah. it's uh, that is a movie about how Gordon Gecko was awesome. That Oliver Stone very much did not intend to be a movie about how J Wall Street power players are awesome. And the same goes for Born in the Fourth of July. Okay, let's go to our uh, next last segment here, uh, which I'm going to call the Supreme Court says it's okay to cyber. This is about the Net Choice case, which is a big free speech internet case that came down next week. Liz Nolan Brown, you have written about this extensively. Can you explain what this case was about and what the ruling meant? Yeah, essentially, so, uh, Florida and Texas both passed laws saying that um, certain social media platforms cannot moderate certain sorts of speech. Um, speech that either, you know, depending on the, on the different law, came from a candidate or was about a candidate for office or speech that was based on a, on a person's viewpoint. And they said that, you know, they could not suppress that kind of content or block that sort of content. Um, NetChoice, which is a group that represents a lot of big tech companies, um, objected because obviously that, you know, falls under the category of compelling speech because, uh, you know, the First Amendment also protects our right not to say certain things. And this is telling these private companies that they have to associate with certain sorts of speech, um, even if they don't want to. 
uh, the Supreme, the district courts, we've gotten different dis, um, appellate court and district court rulings on it. Um, most notably the fifth circuit, which was like, actually this Texas law does not concern speech at all. This is about, you know, conduct on behalf of the social media companies and, and the way that they moderate, you know, um, posts on, on the social media platforms does not implicate speech whatsoever. So, uh, the case went to the Supreme court and the Supreme court delivered a ruling that is, that is pretty good. Um, it, it sent the both cases uh, back to their respective appeals courts, saying you have to go over this with this different standard of, of how we look at speech because um, Netflix, or Netflix, NetChoice challenged the law on, on, you know, that the whole law was wrong. And they said, you know, you actually have only sort of looked at certain applications, we want to send these back to, to the appeals court so that they can consider the way that the First Amendment appeals to the whole thing. So, you know, that that's they didn't totally strike down the laws. However, the good part is they were basically like, hey, Fifth Circuit, you are totally wrong, though, about this idea that these laws do not implicate speech. They obviously implicate speech. And insofar as, you know, they require this sort of um, this content moderation to be done in this certain way where they can't block things or whatever, that is very clearly unconstitutional and in a violation of the First Amendment because, you know, uh, content moderation is a form of speech. The way that they make these editorial decisions is a form of speech. And so um, on on the, the major sort of questions that were being argued and the major issues being put forth by the tech groups, the Supreme Court essentially sided with the tech groups and was like, hey, you know, this this is speech and you can't do this. Uh, Liz, you said this was a pretty good decision. What would have made it a better decision? Well, I guess just because it didn't, they weren't like, hey, we're striking down these laws immediately. Um, you know, so I, it wasn't like a resounding immediate defeat of, of these two statutes. And, you know, there are, I guess, there's always the chance that the appeals courts could go back and, and redo the review and be like, they're still constitutional. Um, but, but, you know, it seems like for all intents and purposes, they, they will they said that they're not constitutional and they there's very little likelihood that they will be found that way in the long run. Uh, Catherine, Liz makes a pretty clear point that this is a case about free speech and the First Amendment. And uh, that point was also made clear in a, a New York Times op-ed by Tim Wu, who has uh, worked in various administrations, been a long time sort of um, guru, influential thinker in the world of tech, antitrust, um, that sort of thing. And his, his piece was titled, The First Amendment is Out of Control. He wrote that judges have transmuted a constitutional provision meant to protect unpopular opinion yeah. into an all-purpose yeah. tool of <laughs> legislative nullification that now mostly protects corporate interests. Nearly any law that has to do with the movement of information can be attacked in the name of the First Amendment. He thinks this is a bad thing. Catherine, is the First Amendment out of control? The First Amendment is out of control in the awesomest possible way. <laughs> and Tim Wu sucks so bad. <laughs> and I say this as someone whose views on Tim Wu are shaped almost exclusively by one Elizabeth Nolan Brown, so it's a little crazy to woosplain with her on the pod, but he is, his instincts are unerringly wrong in this area. And uh, the idea that, yes, the First Amendment is supposed to protect, um, you know, among other things, political dissent. Absolutely. Yep. That's, that's one thing the First Amendment is for. It's for a lot of things. It's for all the kinds of speech. That's the whole deal is like, maybe the government won't be very good at parsing these distinctions. And we should have very, very, very broad protections for all kinds of speech. The idea that the corporations have somehow taken over the First Amendment is something that um, Tim Wu and also kind of the vaguely affiliated Lena Khans <laughs> and others um, who want to make everything about corporate power uh, have been pushing for a long time. But um, this is not about corporate power. This is about free speech for individual citizens. It is about free speech in all of its manifestations. And Tim Wu can sit down. Okay, yeah, so this is about I, free speech for everyone. Quick. Yeah, go ahead. Just yep. one quote from the opinion itself that's so good is just, um, however imperfect the private marketplace of ideas, here was a worse proposal. The government itself deciding when speech was imbalanced and then coercing speakers to provide more of some views and less of others. And that was that's from the decision itself. And like, I think that sums it up good. 
It's just that very could like, be published free. in Reason Magazine. So this is about free speech and free expression. That is what Catherine says. That's what Liz says. Nick, uh, the the thing though is that I I can feel at least some of our listeners out there in roundtable land. Uh, I can feel them sort of. I, I don't know, getting their dander up a little bit because part of what this was about was the ability, the right of um, social media companies like Facebook and Twitter to moderate content and indeed to take down content, perhaps even politically disfavored or uh, sort of politically adjacent co content, right? The, the Texas and Florida uh, laws were about the sense that Facebook and Twitter in particular were um, were bad for conservatives, were, were policing conservative speech. So how excited are you that Facebook can go on shadow banning Trump supporters? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think these decisions, which are going to take a, a way to actually work back up to the level of policy, were much the the fears were much ado about nothing. The idea that conservatives were being blocked or suppressed on uh, social media platforms uh, and were being disfavored. That was never really quite the case. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to be worried about that. What's interesting to me is to look at this in conjunction with uh, the uh, Murthy v. Missouri case, uh, which actually gave the government more expansive rights than I think a lot of libertarians would have wanted to jawbone or kind of pressure social media companies. So I'm actually excited that it seems as if the Internet is remaining ungovernable at least in any meaningful way by the government. Um, and I think the more power that you put into the actual operators and owners and users of platforms, the better it is. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about all of this until we get to next term's big cases about age verification and things like that. All right. I think that is just about all the time for free expression we have on this podcast. Let's finish up with our usual end of show segment. What you watching and consuming? Catherine, let's start with you. I, as I mentioned, was in New York City this week and somehow accidentally went to an advanced screening of a movie that comes out this weekend. Uh, I didn't mean to, but Wait, it are you me? I went to, I am, I, I was playing the part of Peter Suderman in New York this weekend, and I went to uh, Fly Me to the Moon, which is a rom-com about the Apollo 11 mission. It stars Scarlett Johansson as Don Draper, but for NASA, and also inexplicably Channing Tatum as a rocket scientist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's a is very he, nice is he a rocket scientist by day and stripper by night? I hope he, he is. He's I guess technically he's an astronaut turned launch coordinator, which like I he's a lovely young man, but I simply will not believe that he has one single thought behind those eyes. And um, the movie is dumb, but it was very very delightful. If you happen to be a lady who likes space and rom coms, I don't know any ladies like that really oh wait it's me um then you might enjoy this movie uh the twist in the movie which is in the advertising so i'm not really giving anything away uh it's also about whether or not the moon landing was faked so it's it's a lot there are hijinks um i i also watched oppenheimer this weekend and <laughs> so i just want to say it's the same movie uh, it has the same kind of structure as oppenheimer except for it's a rom-com. And if that doesn't make you want to see it, I don't know what will. Uh, Fly Me to the Moon, Scarlett Johansson, Channing Tatum. It comes out uh, this coming weekend. I don't know why I saw it last week. Wait, so are they wondering if Scarlett Johansson or Channing Tatum are maybe actually communists? And is the third act just about like the grief and horror from what you've invented and how it's going to kill everyone? Um, yes, except for exactly the opposite of that. Oh. That doesn't sound the same. I'm not excited to see this movie anymore. All right, Liz, <laughs> Liz, let's let's. Uh, what what have you been watching and uh, reading out there in real America? Uh, uh, so like almost nothing because uh, I just moved recently. Is that which is why I'd like to explain like my background, which is a disaster area. Um, there's just like carpet pads everywhere and and boxes. Uh, but so the only thing I've I've been catching up on hacks. That's the the only thing I've consumed recently, uh, which I think ended like a month or had two ago uh but hacks uh on it, it's uh gene smart and uh oh i don't remember the other girl's name have we talked about hacks out here before we have not talked about hacks so tell us oh. briefly what the show is about 
It's about a uh, stand-up comedian who is uh, past her prime, allegedly. Um, but unlike Joe Biden, she um, this is this is unfair to her, and she actually has the you know this it's now on its third season, and she has this sort of a great comeback where she stops doing like stupid Vegas uh, hacky sort of comedy, and she starts doing uh, puts on her own special on like a Netflix sort of thing, and then now she's in this latest season she's vying for a late night seat, and she's in her seventies, I think, um, and she's doing this all with the help of this younger uh, comedy writer who she hires to help her write jokes and they have this sort of very tumultuous relationship because she's very demanding and um, just sort of a, a diva and, and an asshole but um, also you know has a lovable core and so the show is a lot about the dynamic between these two um, and I just finished the, the last season which is great just like the other two are and one of the best things about it I think is is the dynamic between these two and you have a lot of like this woman is in her 70s and the writer she hires is uh, is supposed to be in her her 20s, I think, very early 20s. So um, they have a lot of like clashes about different things. Like there's a clash about like bisexuals and about gender and about, um, you know, there's this one thing where this in, in the final season where she gets caught telling, you know, offensive jokes and it's circulating before she's supposed to go give a talk at Columbia or something like that. And everyone's like ready to cancel her. And, you know, so the, the young writer's like, well, maybe you should be held accountable. And she's like, I'm never apologizing for a joke. So that's sounds sort of terrible but what what makes it the show really great is that it never comes down fully on either of their sides like it's not like one of the shows where like you know which side the writers are on and they're 100 percent on one side and one character is only saying the opposite as like so that they can like have the the character that's on their side saying the right thing um it's it's always like both sides are kind of saying some things that are sort of right and some things that are sort of wrong and they don't you know beat you over the head with, with morals even though they they do sort of have this sort of generational divide on a lot of issues surrounding comedy and how it should be interpreted and things like that. So the show is in itself just really funny and enjoyable and to watch on a surface level, but it's also got this really cool dynamic in that respect too that I really like. I'm just shocked that a libertarian journalist would recommend a show that both sides is things. I just I can't <laughs> Shocking, really believe I know, right? that <laughs> happened here, especially a show about uh, about comics and comedy. Nick, what have you been watching and reading? Uh, I want to very quickly just say Hacks is great and Jean Smart is having one of those so fantastic great. third acts in her career because she was also in the Watchmen series that was on HBO and a couple of other things and it's just continues to get better and better. It's um, That is the lesson we should take about aging, not what Joe Biden and Donald Trump are up to, I think. Um, I read The Last Rancher. It's a novel by uh, the Last Rancher, a novel by Robert Rabine, who is somebody I went to graduate school with at SUNY Buffalo 30 years ago or so. Um, and it is a generational saga about people, a uh, family, the uh, children generation who are all in their 20s and 30s and 40s coming back to a ranch after the patriarch has been in a bad accident. And there's a lot of uh, repair to be done literally and figuratively. It is a great generational saga set in Dodge City, uh, Kansas. Uh, if you like Sam Shepard and Ann Beatty, uh, this is the type of book it is. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of in the theme that we're talking, if, if we're talking about some kind of reproachment between the generations, this book is uh, definitely in that mold. And it's just, it's got a fast, uh, engaging plot that is built around various kinds of family secrets and legal uh, troubles that come to the fore. And it's a really fantastic look at how areas of the country that are kind of dead, you know, farming, ranching, things like that, that have been depopulated because people don't need to do the work there anymore. What happens to the next generation that chooses to leave in order to have their life? And what is their relationship to home? I think that's a good metaphor for a lot of things going on in America right now. So uh, that's The Last Rancher. He also wrote uh, two other books, one called Dragging Wyatt Earp, which is uh, the main drag in Dodge City. And it's a series of essays about what it's like to grow up in a legendary but kind of shitty uh, frontier town. And uh, Hicks, Tribes and Dirty Realists, which is a study of what happened to fiction in America after a kind of high water mark of metafiction and experimental fiction uh, met up with a return to regional fiction. Uh, and that is an essential guide to if, if you're wondering why certain novels are good and why certain novels are bad. Uh, Robert Rabine really gets to that in Hicks, Tribes and Dirty Realists. 
All right. So speaking of experimental fiction and things that do not have fast, engaging plots, I watched the third season of The Bear. Uh, the The Bear is, of course, a, a show set in Chicago uh, about a, a, a chef who takes over the family uh, beef sandwich restaurant and then converts it into a super fancy, high, you know, sort of uh, fine dining, um, experimental cuisine uh, uh, restaurant. And so it's very much about kind of working the, the working class, but also about Chicago and also about food and food culture, but also just about creativity and the the toll that it takes um, and that sort of the, the challenges of being an intense and creative person. And uh, the show was really Really well received in its first season. The second season was a little bit controversial, and um, reviews have been much more negative for the third season. The third season is itself an experiment uh, in in storytelling. So part of the show is that it starts with it starts with uh, oh this uh, um, the at the restaurant the the main character the chef Carmi is uh, is laying out some ground rules. They're not going to repeat any ingredient or element. Every single night is going to have a totally different menu. And then the show goes and does that. Every single episode has a completely different structure. There's no repeat elements. It is incredibly audacious. Uh, and But people have complained that because of it, it's just sort of, it's audacious and experimental, but to the point of just showing off and it's kind of boring, not enough happens, people don't change, there are no character arcs. And I, I take some of those criticisms, except yes, Yes, that is what I want from drama. I want something that is formally showy and audacious. And I want I, I, what I love about this show is that it shows how hard it is for people to change. It shows how difficult it is for people to become different people. It's not about events happening. Instead, it's about characters sort of dealing with the fact that they are fundamentally and unalterably themselves. And so is everyone else. And then what are you going to do about that? How are you going to make a life out of the material that you've been given for you? And how how is everybody else going to deal with that? And how are you going to deal with everyone else and the way that they are? And so it is this great show about, about stuckness and about coming to grips with yourself and your background and why you are the way you are. It's also a great show about creativity and the creative drive. And it's just, it's gorgeous. I love looking at this show because, because it is so visually audacious. There are all these incredibly long takes and also super intense close-ups that just allow you to see the actors' faces. And the acting on this show is so wonderful and so nuanced. And there are so many scenes that, in which n not very much happens. It's not like this is a plot-driven scene. And yet you see two people conversing in a way that is naturalistic and that feels real and textured and kind of discursive, but also like everybody is in the conversation with an agenda or with some sort of built-in uh, relationship in the, the substrate of, of of who they are. And it's just the kind of thing that you don't see on television because so much TV is concerned with, well, we're going to hit our plot beats. We're just going to sort of make something happen. And hey, there's got to be a big turn at the end of the second act. And that's that. And you, you have those big emotional moments. The show is actually pretty structurally classic, right? You can time the first, second, and third acts, right? They they show up when they should, both in individual episodes and in the, the series as a whole. But it's not about big things happening. It's about small things feeling really intense every day. And I absolutely loved it. The critics are wrong. It's The Bear season three. Strongly recommend it. Uh, Nick, uh, before we go, are there any uh, are there any upcoming events or guests you want to advertise here? Yeah, we've got a uh, Soho Forum in New York uh, next Monday. I believe it's July 15th. And uh, then we have an event on July 23rd If you uh, where uh, Liz Nolan Brown uh, and Caitlin Bailey will be participating in a panel to discuss a new documentary that we are going to premiere in New York City about the back page case, which had to do with uh, prosecuting people who ran classified uh, ads for sexual, uh, I don't even want to say sexual services, adjacent to sexual services. It's a great story about um, government overreach and uh, the uh, uh, attacks on free speech and whatnot. Um, but that both of those events uh, can be found at reason.com slash events. Uh, buy tickets, they're going fast. Go see Liz Nolan Brown. Yeah. Go watch the excellent work by Reason's uh, video folks. Um, and and go uh, go 
pay attention to this story. It is a story that we have covered. I think I, I will just brag here. This is a story that we and that Liz Nolan Brown in particular have covered better than just about any other publication. Um, and it's important. It's important for free speech and for all sorts of other things. Uh, that is all the time we have this week. If you like our work here, if you want to support us, you can always go to reason.com slash donate and give us your money. That's reason.com slash donate. Thank you, as always, for listening. I'm Peter Suderman, and this has been The Reason Roundtable.